Hi, everyone, and thank you once again for joining me for another episode of my Gaudi Mets Best 22 podcast and YouTube video. Uh, as you can see, if you're watching this, we have a very special guest today, a man who needs no introduction, uh, Bishop Robert Barron. Obviously, I've been on his show. I've interviewed him once before. We've worked together off and on on some projects here and there over the course of the past 20 years. I wanted I do want to disabuse some of my viewers <laughs> of a misconception. I, I get emails all the time saying, could you ask Bishop Barron this? Could you ask as if you and I are like best buddies from childhood or something in constant <laughs> email. Uh, but but we're not. We're not. Uh, we know each other. We're like professional acquaintances and so forth. But no, uh, I, I can't get your daughter a job at Word on Fire. <laughs> so, so there you go. Also, like people notice, I'm wearing uh, a jacket today and I'd like to say it's an honor, Bishop Barron, but it's actually because it's my uh, my shirt is wrinkled. <laughs> and so there you go. And I'm reminded of that. Of sin, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the Johnny Cash song. You know, he stumbled out of bed one morning and put on his cleanest dirty shirt and 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 <laughs> are you a Johnny coming down oh that's it so you're a Johnny yeah. Cash fan eh, Bishop oh yeah Barron? Chris okay. Darfson wrote that song but Johnny made it famous yeah yeah he sure as heck did I didn't know Chris Christopherson wrote this yeah song. he wrote that that's song. great all right well an, enough uh matter uh, obviously for those who don't know Bishop Barron is now the ordinary the bishop of the diocese of Winona Rochester in Minnesota, uh, obviously he runs uh, Word on Fire, and uh, which is a huge deal. I think the last time I checked, uh, your Word on Fire YouTube videos are now approaching 200 million hits, or maybe more than that. I don't know, 150 million something, something like I that. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, uh, you know, very successful, uh, which is why actually uh, I follow Word on Fire and why uh, it interests me greatly because I'm interested in evangelization and I consider it to be the the single most successful evangelizing enterprise in the history of the modern church, just about anywhere. So that's fantastic. But today we're going to be discussing uh, serious topics, uh, Vatican II, the theology that led up to Vatican II, the background really the, uh, that conversation requires an even larger conversation about sort of the history of 20th century Catholic theology in particular. I would direct people to uh, a video that uh, Bishop Barron did with his co-worker Brandon Vaught uh, mm -hmm. on Vatican II, which I think deals with a lot of the very basic outlines of Vatican II. I watched that and I thought, that's great, but I, I want to dig a little bit uh, a little bit deeper. So let's let's uh, I want to begin uh, with a very basic and simple question. Um, what do you, th how would you characterize the, the debate between communio and concilium? Uh, you know, that's often tossed out there. This is the, this is the great debate. Communio was the conservatives, concilium were the liberals, which is all a bit boilerplate, but what were some of the deeper theological issues that were in play here? I think nature and grace, ecclesiology, soteriology. So, so maybe you could elaborate on that and maybe even go back before the council to discuss the Balthazar Rahner dynamic and what that was all about. Yeah, there's a lot there. And I used to teach a course when I was at, at the seminary in, uh, we call it classics of 20th century theology. And it was mostly the great players, both Protestant and Catholic, prior to Vatican II. So Tillich and Barth and Rahner and Balthazar and de Lubach and, you know, many others. So as you say, the nature grace thing was was really basic in the theological discussion. Interestingly, like when you and I were coming of age, that fell off the table. Hardly yeah. anyone talked about that in the late 60s into the 70s. 80s. No one talked about it, but it was the burning question prior to the council. And I think it remains of tremendous importance, whether it's, it's explicitly addressed or not. I think it's always implicitly there. Here's how I used to put it, Larry. Um there's a non-competitive but asymmetrical relationship between nature and grace. And here's what I mean. Christianity is an incarnational religion. So we say the word became flesh. So the supernatural comes into the natural in a <clears throat> perfecting and elevating way. And there's Thomas Aquinas, right? Grace elevates, yeah. presupposes, perfects nature. But notice I, I use the term so non-competitive. doesn't destroy nature. It elevates, it perfects it, but it's also asymmetrical, which means grace is always first and greater than nature. And that's a generic way now of stating, I think, the, the basic truth of it. And the different schools kind of fall according to how you yeah. read or misread that. 
So take someone like Karl Barth. I have great admiration for Barth. His critique of Friedrich Schleiermacher was much needed in the early 20th century. His critique of liberal Protestantism in favor of a biblically based, all of that. But see, when Barth says things like, what's nature? It's the crater left behind by the explosion of grace. Well, okay, now we've overstated it. Now grace yeah. has crushed and destroyed nature. Nature brings nothing to the table. Nature is just left behind. It's all... You know, grazie, total grace, grazia sola. That's too strong. That's hitting the um, the primacy of grace so powerfully that nature is obliterated. The other extreme is some form of it's all nature. So think of of uh, an extreme theological liberalism that would simply reduce the supernatural to the natural. So what's it all about? It's about creating a better world here, a more politically. Uh, just uh, a kinder social arrangement. Um, maybe extreme forms of liberation theology would take that form of just reducing the supernatural utterly to the natural. Or an extreme then, Ron Arianism. Extreme. Yeah, but see, right, an extreme Ron Arianism, because I would argue there are kind of moderate forms of, of these things too. And, yes. and in some ways, that's where the debate really got engaged. Ronner is a good example, I think. You know, you and I think both have a great respect for Rahner. Ron is one of the yes. you know, great geniuses of the of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, he knew Aquinas extremely well, knew Kant and the modern tradition and so on. Now, what's Rahner about? I, I kind of take um, John Milbank's assessment seriously, where he says Rahner, deeply interested in nature, supernature, but he tended to naturalize the supernatural. Now, not reduce it. That's the extreme form of it. But he tended to take nature as the um, interpretive key to supernature, to draw supernature within the confines of the natural. Uh, something very similar in Paul Tillich uh, on the Protestant side. Tillich is a, is a more moderate liberal. His method of correlation, right, which says the answers of Scripture should be correlated to the questions coming up from human experience. Well, as Karl Barth, I think here correctly said, the method of correlation would work beautifully in paradise or heaven. The problem is it doesn't work well in our fallen world because we ask the wrong questions. But see, notice in both cases, for Rahner, it's my present uh, natural openness to grace is what measures grace. Or for Tillich, my questions become the measure of the answers that are given. The corrective yeah. provided by our friend Balthazar over and against Rahner comes in there. He would say, sure, I think there's a supernatural existential. Sure, uh, Schleiermacher saw it. Aquinas in his own way saw it. There's a natural openness of the human spirit to God. But that receptor should never become the measure of what's received. Rather, what's received, remember Balthazar's thing, it, it overwhelms Yes. The, re the receptor, just as the the great mountain avalanche <laughs> would overwhelm anything that was designed to receive it. And, and so there's the primacy of grace, the, the asymmetrical relationship between nature and grace. That's a, a roundabout way of saying why I came to think Balthazar handled this problem, at least with relative adequacy. <laughs> they use David Tracy's phrase there, you know, that, that of all these, <laughs> these approaches, Balthazar kind of got the accents the most correct. But in, in my lifetime, I think, you know, we were almost the same age. Uh, the Rahner Balthazar fight was between a call it a, a more moderate form of theological liberalism in Rahner, and then this great corrective coming from Bart. Here, here's yeah. a, I'm rambling too much here, but here's another sign in this thing. I did a lot of work with Tillich. I did my doctoral work on Aquinas and Tillich on creation. And there's a lot about Paul Tillich that I like as a Catholic because he's very philosophical. He's happy to use those categories. His um, treatment of God in volume one of the systematic theology is very fine in many ways. But what's the thinnest part of, of Tillich systematics? Volume two on Christology. Because you don't need a thick Christology if, if you're in, in a liberal uh, framework, because your human experience is sufficient to receive the grace that's coming. In Bart and Balthazar, on the contrary, you have a very thickly described Christology, because it's, it's the specificity 
of yeah. this revelation that matters more. And I think those are some of the contours. Oh, I think so. And Balthazar thought that uh, Rahner's theology, Christology uh, in particular, was a bit thin, especially in his soteriology. He didn't think Rahner had much of a theology of of the cross at all. No, Uh, you don't really need it there. And I always think one of the the clues for me is um, Rahner's great text, what in in English we call it the... um, I forget now, but the the uh, it's called Grundkost des Glaubens, Grundkurs. foundations right, of Christian German. faith. Foundations of Christian faith, right? Yeah, but but see, the, the a German theological ear is not going to miss Grundkost des Glaubens calls to mind the Glaubenslehre of Schleiermacher. Yeah, uh, Bart answers the Glaubenslehre with a Kirchliche Dogmatik because <laughs> dogma he thought was more important than Glaub than the, the subjective experience. Where for the Schleiermacherian tradition, which includes Tillich and Rahner, it's very much beginning with our experience. So for Schleiermacher, the feeling of absolute dependency or the <clears throat> sense and taste for the infinite. Well, if that becomes the measure of revelation, then it's it's this interiority and subjectivity that that takes pride of place. Um, the, the corrective yep. to that is a thickly described uh, Christology expressed in more dogmatic language. That's one way to state the difference. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I mean, going to our mutual experience in the post-Vatican II Church, you said that uh, as we were coming of age, this whole question of nature and grace, the whole debate, say, between De Lubac and Lagrange, uh, the French Jesuits yeah. of Lyon and so on, uh, yeah. was not really talked about, right? And it wasn't, because essentially no some some version of the correlational method of Rahner yeah. had, had won the day. There was a hegemony of, of Rahner just about everywhere, and but of a particular kind. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you, you mentioned the nature of, you know, I like to say that what happens then is the experiential tail begins to wag right. the Christological right. dog. Quite okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, but what, what it ignored, what it seemed to me all the time, what it was ignoring. And I think this is a great part of the post Vatican II confusion and what led to the post Vatican II confusion. What is ignoring is the deep and profound ambiguity. And this would be Bart and Balthazar, the deep yeah. and profound and amb- ambiguity of our experience. Yes. <laughs> right. Why do I trust my experience that that fully? Yeah. I mean, we, we don't trust our own experience and a whole range of other things uh, and other disciplines where we teach ourselves to sort of be self-critical and stuff. But I guess when it comes to listening to the Holy Spirit, there's just supposed to be this unvarnished, <laughs> unvarnished and trust. Yeah, and here's my Catholic, you know, instincts coming through. Is I think what Schleiermacher described, what Ronald describes, as I say, I think it's present. Sure, there is a kind of natural openness, but it is, it's a compromised openness. It's think of of Delubach's line about you know cette claudication mystérieuse. There's this mysterious limp in yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Well, that affects us morally, but also intellectually. And that's why Bart's line about, sure, it'll work great in paradise or heaven when we're perfectly constituted to receive it and to ask the right questions. But we're not in this fallen world. And so we need someone to come in and fix us in a fundamental way so the questions improve, so that the experience gets reworked. You know, another figure that comes to my mind here, because I used to teach him with great enthusiasm at Mundelein, is Kierkegaard. You know, religiousness A, religiousness B. But this is A would be, you know, I, I need a teacher who's going to teach me basic truths. And once I understand those truths, I can I can let go of the teacher. I don't need them anymore. Religious is B is no, no, I don't need a teacher. I need a savior. I need someone to come in and rework me. Yeah. You know, I need to be knocked to the ground. And it's, think of think of, of Saul going to Damascus. Well, so it, does he have the feeling of absolute dependency? Is he radically open to transcendence and all that? Well, maybe in some vague way, but he's also going to persecute the Church of Jesus Christ. He's he's messed up, and needs a yeah, massive yeah, yeah. intervention of grace, so that then he can begin to ask the right questions and experience things differently. Th- that that makes a difference. 
Yeah, it does. And, and I, uh, I don't want to throw you a curveball here because we didn't talk about this off camera and I don't want to put you on the spot because you are a bishop. But I would say that to me, this is one of the things that concerns me. And then we'll get back back on to one of the things that concerns me about many of the things that I've been reading about the synodal process and the listening sessions and these yeah. kinds of things. There seems to be just I mean, only about one percent of Catholics worldwide participate in the synods. And yet right. all of a sudden, according to certain certain proponents of this, we're, we're this is a new expression of the census fidelium. And if we don't listen to it, we're not listening to the Holy spirit. Right. Um, and and <laughs> this, this is problematic in my view. You don't have to comment. Oh, on no, this, no. But I, I'll be okay. happy to comment about that. Cause I, I okay. agree with you uh, to gather a group of people and let's say it's 1%, but it could be 10% or 50% and say to cool. Oh, there's the voice of the Holy spirit. <laughs> well, yeah. no, that's the voice of these people. And yes, the Holy spirit might be, active, and we have to do a lot of very careful discerning in light of the teaching of the church and revelation and the authority of the church and all of that. But yes, I think there are people, if you want, just rushing to judgment about that. Well, clearly, you know, vox populi, vox dei, well, not necessarily. The vox populi could be, you know, often in left field. And so I, I got to be much, much more careful and reticent about making the immediate connection to the vox dei. Um, so no, I, I quite agree with that. I think we have to be very careful about that process. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, I'm, I'm glad we got that out there, but I, I do want to return now to these, these pre, uh, pre conciliar yeah. debates. And I want to raise an issue before, obviously what, what we've been talking about is, is in the exact sort of theological milieu in which, in which the council arose. Yeah. And the question then arises, well, if that's the case, then maybe the council is irrelevant because are not those debates irrelevant? But the answer is, no, those debates are not irrelevant. Uh, they yeah. have this ongoing significance, and we'll get back to that. But I wanted to ask you a question. And once again, I want to throw you a curveball, but it, it just popped into my head. Um, our mutual friend, Matthew Levering, Mm -hmm. uh, one of one of his sort of intellectual projects is to bring together the communio theologian yeah. types, the Thomist types, the first yeah. thing neocon types and so forth. And uh, he and I, in conversation with a few other people, you know, have often maybe come to the to the conclusion that maybe just maybe uh, the neo scholastics have been sort of unfairly caricatured. Mm -hmm. Uh, by ressourcement communio theologians like you and me is just these arid, desiccated, yeah, right. de deductive. You know, you get you get what I'm saying. Right. Um, what would you what would you say to that to that accusation that there was far more meat in what the neo scholastics were doing uh, than simply you know this two tiered universe, nature, grace, that kind of thing? What would you say to that criticism? Right. I think there's something to the the pushback, let's say, to that more caricatured view. And I mean, I'll I'll confess maybe in my years of teaching, giving in occasionally to those stereotypes of, you know, the, me too. Me too. The favorite word we always use is arid, you know, for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's dry, you know. Well, okay, yes. Yeah. Sometimes I read texts of let's say a Garigou Lagrange, and you get the impression in his high metaphysical text that it's all a deductive enterprise. And there seems very little reference to Jesus, to Revelation. It just seems like an Aristotelian. I remember being at a conference many years ago with someone who was advocating a kind of neo garigou Lagrangeism, and he was urging a return to Aristotle's physics. And I remember all of my race or small uh, instincts were going, oh, come on. I mean, I love Aristotle, but I don't think returning to Aristotle's physics is the key to moving the project forward. So my point there is there was something problematic and that that our friends de Lubac and Donnie Lu and, right, and right. Baltazar and come think of Baltazar's famous thing about he's studying with with de Lubac in Lyon and he says if this is theology I, I would have jumped off a building you know I mean he he just found it oppressively rationalistic um no reference to scripture fathers etc okay having right. said all of that and I think there is something to it nevertheless Agarigou Lagrange um writes powerfully and movingly on the spiritual life and his knowledge of people like John of the Cross and Bernard and the, and the whole spiritual tradition. Um, <clears throat> the, the Thomas who recovered the biblical side of Aquinas. So it's easy enough to say maybe some neo-scholastics weren't very biblical, but heck Aquinas was. Aquinas was a, a magister sacri pagine. He was yeah. first and foremost a, a biblical man, a biblical commentator. 
and out of that came, you know, his the disputed questions and then the summary of the disputed questions. We all know the more rationalistic side, but it came from a deeply biblical engagement. Aquinas, who is profoundly marked by Augustine, but especially the pseudo-Dionysius and, yep. and um, uh, other of the Eastern fathers, think of, of Maximus and so on. So uh, there, I'd say the Thomas. They they were not given fair treatment. If they were just reduced to a kind of Aristotelian uh, deduction, they, they Aquinas himself was indeed filled with all these patristic and, and scriptural uh, sources. So that's the I agree with Matt Levering. That's the way forward is to recover that side of of the great Aquinas. You know, like in our our nature grace debate, say between De Lubac and Gary Lagrange. Uh, who's got a who's got Aquinas right? I've always said they both do because look at you can find yes. Gargou Lagrange texts in Aquinas. You can find De Lubac texts in Aquinas. Aquinas is like a he's like a continent. I, I mean, how he kept it straight in his own <laughs> mind is a miracle. But that he yeah. said some things that really do sound like two layer cake and nature has his yeah. own finalities yeah. and then a super he does say those things in some texts clearly and then other texts he sounds much more like Henri de Lubac. Okay, that's Aquinas. He's complicated, you know. And yeah. so the, the debate was joined there. Um, but Just like think, Aquinas on predestination is sort of yeah. equally sort of ambiguous. There's all kinds of stuff. I remember Michel Corbin, who was my um, doctoral director in Paris and was a great Aquinas man. But he used to say that about how in the world, pre-computer and without all kinds of secretarial help, he kept it straight in his own mind. So that yeah. you'd say, oh, here's an anomaly. Thomas said, here, you know, A there, but not A there. Well, duh, of course he did. He's writing these <laughs> mountainous texts. So I mean, yeah. I but in a way that gave rise to the 20th century debate because they're they're both texts that are in Aquinas. Yeah, and of course there are, there are political issues. When one can't ignore yeah. the politics of France, Action Francaise versus Catholic right. Action, and and so and the you know the Lagrange was involved with the Marshal Pétain regime, and De right. Lubac was in the resistance. But I yeah. often say the same thing when 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 I get into these debates with Thomas in particular on nature and grace. They're often shocked when I say, "To be honest with you, I don't care what Aquinas said." Of course, I care. But in another sense, I don't care because here's this Aquinas can be wrong. And re regardless of what yeah. his eventual position is on the nature and grace issue, maybe he was wrong. The deeper question for me is what is it that the broader tradition and revelation taken as a whole yeah. teach us about nature and grace? And that is why I came down, come down on De Lubac's position yeah. that ultimately we have a single final nat yeah. a supernatural end, uh, uh, you know, I think that, no, that's perfectly right. Uh, in other words, let's get beyond just debating endlessly about text within Aquinas, because as I, I'll just say that again, bluntly, they're both there. <laughs> there are, yeah. there are texts on this side and texts on that side in Aquinas. There just are. And he probably didn't get it perfectly straight in his own mind, but does our whole tradition broadly construed, get it right? And I would say yes. And, and that's how I try to articulate it. It's a non-competitive, but asymmetrical relationship between nature and grace. And what Aquinas really got right was grace supposes, elevates, and perfects nature. That's the right way to think about it. Now, that's got implications all over the place for every branch of theology. Um, so I think if we settle there, in my judgment, we're doing fine. And then we can maybe leave to doctoral candidates, you know, the, the particular debates about texts within Aquinas. But the great tradition, I think, broadly construed, does see it the way that we've been describing. Yeah, and it's it, but it is interesting as well uh, that, you know, it, to me, you know, people like De Lubac, uh, uh, Balthazar, Jean Danielou, Romano Guardini, Louis Bouillet, certainly yeah. Chenu and Congar, that these people were all considered to be liberal to the, liberals to the point of heretics before the council. Yeah. And yet when I was in graduate school at Fordham, they were considered retrograde reactionaries, every, one yeah, every single one of them to be gotten beyond. And yet yeah. here I am, you know, I, I have so identified with with that school of, of, of theology uh, that I, I, I said off screen to you, my my mentor at Mount St. Mary's, Germaine Grise, often described himself as an unreconstructed pre-Vatican II liberal. And yet right. when he was teaching me at Mount St. Mary's, he was considered a complete reactionary. Absolutely. 
I'll you know, tell you a and story. you and I have both taken it on the nose from both the yeah. right and the left because precisely of this. for this reason. And I'll tell you a story. Um, it's the year 2000 in Chicago. We had this event on Navy Pier, and it was meant to bring Catholics together. And it actually didn't go that well. But there was one successful gathering, and it was because Cardinal George, who was pretty new at the time in Chicago, and Andrew Greeley. Now, it's a name that people don't know as well now, but boy, in the year 2000, he was the best-known yeah. Catholic in America. Yeah. Priest, sociologist, novelist, controversial figure, all that. So both these tough, uh, very bright, outspoken Chicago Catholics, right? Cardinal George and Andrew Greeley. And then they, I was, at the time, no one knew who I was. I hadn't really begun my sort of public career, but I was there as, I don't know, comic relief, you know. But the two of them... <laughs> And here's the first thing about the two of them I thought was very interesting. They disagreed about humanity vitae, for sure. They disagreed about the church's sexual teaching. Andy would have been a strong liberal, thought humanity vitae was a disaster and all that. And the cardinal thought completely otherwise. Put that to the side. They agreed on practically everything else. They were both 1950s Chicago Catholics who loved priests and collars, nuns and habits, Big Catholic schools full of thousands of kids, rectories with five priests, hospitals with chaplains and Roman collars and nuns and veils. And they, they loved the vibrant, confident, uh, out there Catholicism of the 1950s, you know. Uh, but anyway, in the course of that conversation, I got up at one point and said, I've always loved preconciliar liberals, but I don't really like postconciliar liberals. And I'd never quite said it that way before. It struck me as, yeah, okay, that's right. Because everyone you mentioned, like all my heroes, Dorothy Day, Fulton Sheen, Henri de Luba, Carol Wojtyla, Josef Ratzinger, Hans Urs von Balthasar, all those people were liberals before the council. They all were. They yeah. all would have been seen as part of the liberal you know, movement. After the council, all those people. So I came of age, same time you did, going through school. If you read Balthazar, I'm not joking. You had to hide it under covers and you had to, I, again, I'm not joking. <laughs> no, if I know you you're not. I had to do the same thing. Text, yeah. If yeah. you went to the um, library and asked for an Ignatius Press book, uh, the librarian would kind of give you a look like, you know. Well, Ignatius was bringing out in the early days, especially all those people. They were bringing yes. out the preconciliar liberals, you know. Yeah. But by the time I was going to school, they were all very suspect, dangerous figures. Yeah. Ratzinger may be the most interesting. Uh, when you and I were like in our 20s, Cardinal Ratzinger, come on, the Panzer Cardinal, and he was you know, the scourge of heretics, and he was the uber conservative weirdo. Ratzinger, he was the, he was a, the wunderkind liberal of, of 1962. So anyway... Yeah, I do think we've come to a certain more balanced perception of this. And I think the position that you and I take more or less, I mean, obviously, I think it's the reasonable position, but it represents a kind of equilibrium, I think, you know, it loves the council because all these people were conciliar people. They were all supporters. Yeah. Think of our friend Baltazar, you know, the Schleifung der Bastionen, we're, we're going to raise the bastions. Yeah. Yeah. That means knock down the medieval walls, let the church out into the world. Well, that's the voice of liberalism in 1950, whenever it was, too. Uh, but so that guy is now your conservative, uh, you know, reactionary. Uh, I, I think we've kind of come to a, an equilibrium that these great conciliar people, but not the goofy post conciliar madness of Catholic progressivism. Uh, yeah. To my mind, that's the way forward. Well, I think, too, oftentimes the problem with Catholic progressivism and why people like Balthazar and de Lubach even a Dietrich von Hildebrand, for example, uh, Jacques Maritain, were yeah. considered to be these retrograde reactionaries by the time you and I are in graduate school, is because a lot of progressive Catholicism at that time was not all, actually all that interested in theology at all. It was yeah. actually a set of cultural conclusions in search of an argument. And so mm -hmm. what, what they would do were, were to politicize debates and to begin with the preferred conclusion and say, look, birth control has to be OK. Women priests have to be OK. Uh, intercommunion with Protestants has to be OK. Yeah. And and any theologian that does not go along with that is clearly a reactionary. So Balthazar yeah. opposed the ordination of women. He supported yeah. Humanae Vitae. And when I was at Fordham in the early 90s, this is what kept being thrown back in my face. Not that they disagreed with his Christology or his soteric. Mm -hmm. It was, oh, yeah. 
he's on the wrong side of all of these all issues. These issues. Right. You know. Yeah. And, and but see, as you say, that's a superficiality, you know, that we just it became a political debate. Uh, what side of the church politics are you on? Yeah. Rather than what are the deep reasons behind these positions? And it came up out of that loamy territory we were just exploring. That's where all these people were shaped and formed. But yeah, that that was largely bracketed. You know, by the time I was a kid, certainly we got none of that, even in Catholic schools. When we got into the serious theological study, Rahner was such a dominant figure. Um, I remember yeah. in the seminary and even university, a typical way to approach a theological question was, okay, what does the Bible say? What do some of the church fathers say? What did Aquinas say? What did Rahner say? And that settled the question. I'm not that's kidding. I, no, that's exactly uh, when I, you know, when I was at Mount St. Mary's, our dog, our main dogmatics teacher, God bless his soul. I loved him. He's passed on to his reward. Monsignor Carol Satterfield had a series of tracks that he had written uh, that went through the whole history of theology. And it was very interesting. I learned a lot, but the yeah. end of every single tract, whether it was <laughs> Ecclesiastes, was Rahner. Rahner. Yeah, he was yeah. the terminus ad quem of all theology is <laughs> yes. Carl Rahner. Rahner. And, okay. and again, we we love and respect Rahner. I read Rahner with great interest and read, I don't know if I read it, oh, yeah. but a, a lot of them, you know, and respected him and saw him. And then once I, I became a more serious student of theology, saw the roots of it as well, going back, I think, to someone like Schleiermacher. It's often pointed out he's Kantian, which indeed he is. So Rahner wanted to reconcile Aquinas and Kant. That's the Russolo project and so on. Yeah. Uh, good, good. That's true. But I think he's also Schleiermacherian, in other words, beginning with experience. So relentlessly, Rahner does that. All his texts, big texts, small texts, uh, occasional texts, begin with our experience of absolute mystery, right? And yeah. then tend to read the doctrines, including Christology, from the standpoint of that experience. That's the, I'm calling it moderate liberalism, that I think Baltazar was suspicious of. When Balthazar said, oh, yeah, Rahner went with Kant, I went with Goethe. Goethe. That, to me, is the great illuminating remark. Rahner went with Kant. In other words, with a transcendental anthropology, I start with uh, the conditions for the possibility of knowing anything. So what's, what are the conditions for the possibility of having a religious experience? Rahner explores that. And then from that standpoint, reads the external world of, of revelation, just as Kant read the external world of nature through the... Um, yeah. hermeneutic yeah. of his own experience. Okay, that was the option Reiner took. For Balthazar, I went with Goethe. So I went with this fellow who didn't like the rationalism of the Enlightenment, didn't like Newton or Kant, and said we should open our eyes and really look out at nature and stop reading it through the lens of our kind of aggressive questioning. Uh, there is Balthazar, right? Begin with the liturgy, begin with the scripture yes. in all of its strangeness, and let its its sometimes shocking objectivity rearrange our subjectivity to make us ask new and fresh questions. Here's another connection. Now, speaking now as a, as a priest and a bishop, uh, we were trained to preach completely in a Ronarian mode, right? So yeah. Ronner trickled down into pastoral life like mad. So how do you preach? Well, you know, there's a little clue you get from the scripture, but the main thing is to get in touch with people's religious experience. When did you experience something like this, right? Well, okay, but the trouble again is I'm now going to read the Bible from the standpoint of my experience, rather than letting the Bible be the Bible, letting the Bible in all of its weirdness uh, uh, shape yeah. me. So my generation, I, I tell you the truth, we were discouraged from preaching biblically because oh the bible you know it's it's, it's, yeah. it's uh, confusing and it's and it's they'll never understand anything and should like, all you should always start with a story story or a joke or with someone's experience now again nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with with no. you know integrating that but it's the ranarian i ultimately schleiermacherian kantian assumption that experience is the norm of revelation Baltazar did yeah. the Copernican revolution, that, that revelation should be the norm of experience. Absolutely. And that's made all, like, in my preaching, if you want to see, I, I, I'm trying anyway, a more Baltazarian style of preaching, oh, yeah. watch my Sunday sermons, is I'm trying to be very biblical and attend to the Bible. And I get so many comments from people like, I, I've never heard anything about the Bible before. It's, it's such a biblical, and I'm like, well, I... <laughs> I hope that a Catholic bishop would preach biblically, um, yeah. but we didn't for a long time. 
We didn't for a long time. No, we didn't. And I, you know, I was in seminary roughly the same time you were. And, and we, I was taught all the same things, you know, be concrete, relate to their experience. Right. Which is why you begin with a story that attempts to set things up for their experience. Yeah. And, and just one tangent before I get back to the, yeah. the sort of theology thing. One tangent is one of the things that I uh, never actually thought was true was that you should never preach from a written script. Uh, mm-hmm. I always thought, well, what? Well, thank God Newman preached from a written script. Thank God Augustine did. Thank God Chrysostom did. Uh, th- that these things were preserved. There is a way to read a homily that isn't wooden or pedantic right. or, or ag- you, there, there is a way of reading that's still very animated and 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 very forthcoming. So it takes anyway. like a lot of skill, and that, that's a, it's a practical question because I I follow the yeah. Fulton Sheen thing, which is you know he didn't want the preacher tied to a text, but he wanted the preacher to write out a text. The, the text should be written yes. out and basically memorized. So yes. Sheen in some ways the best of both worlds. That the, the problem is that my generation got, okay, don't use a text. Well, that means get up there and wing it. Get up there, yeah. and, you know, oh, do yeah. a free asso- religious free association. No, the, the combination would be, as Sheen prepared a text, and then he said, practice it aloud in several languages <laughs> in French and Italian and so on. So that he made sure it was completely in his whole system. Wow. That's fantastic. Uh, well, I, I, I can get on board with that. Uh, but I, I want to get back to the whole thing. Ron or Goethe, Kant, yeah. Schleiermach, are these guys. I, yeah. I've always been interested in some of these other figures that, that don't get talked about enough. And then I want to go on to Vatican II and then the little yeah. time we have left uh, and, and some of the, what what role does Blondell play in all of this? Because he's actually claimed by both camps in some ways. Uh, I, I consider Blondell to be an extremely he's been influential in my thinking, uh, an extremely important figure. So what, what do you think of Blondell and his influence here and where does he fit in this mix? Well, I, I I see him behind a lot of the transcendental sort of movement and and uh, his influence on people like Mary Tan and and others. You know, um, I'm not sure from the other side, like how, how Baltazar would incorporate someone like Blondell. I, I associate him more with the, uh, the transcendental Ranieri yeah. side, but I'm not really a Blondell specialist. Oh, okay, uh, I'm not either, and I've just uh, sort of recently been been rereading a lot of a lot of his where things. Is, where is, so, the, does Baltazar claim him in some way as a as an antecedent? Yeah, he does here and there, but but you're right; it it yeah, doesn't seem sure. he doesn't seem to give him this sort of full throated endorsement right. uh, that he does with, with with some other thinkers. But there, there, but there are thinkers, you know, like a Peggy, a Claudel. A Blondell yeah. uh, no, that sure, yeah. that sometimes you know not all not all theologians you know poets and playwrights and so forth. But anyway, let's let's get to the council then. Um, yeah. it, obviously, we've been in some ways talking about the big picture of the theology that led up to the council, yeah. and obviously, you and I both agree the neo scholastics sort of lose at the council. The progressives have a certain influence, but they don't win either. It's the race so small the de Lubaki and the Ratzingerian wing of things that that sort of wins the day at the council. Uh, and, and then, of course, afterwards, th- that sort of gets derailed. But to me, the, the important thing then for now is to discuss the proper hermeneutic of retrieving the council in yeah. the light of the fact that it is a sort of resource communio, communio council. To that end, Ratzinger famously, you know, obviously, was a proponent of the hermeneutic of continuity, but then later nuanced that when it was criticized and said, well, actually, it's a hermeneutic of reform. You know where I'm going. Yeah, Yeah, reform, because there are some discontinuities in the council with uh, certain aspects of the tradition. And and we have to acknowledge those discontinuities, uh, even though it's in the service of a deeper continuity. And, that, and that's the point of the discontinuity. So I like to follow the hermeneutic of reform. And I, and I was wondering uh, if you would be willing to comment on that first, on the hermeneutic of reform, and then maybe discuss a little bit what some of the discontinuities are. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a Newman man there, I guess. I, I, I've always said Newman is the most important dead person at the council. So that we mentioned all <laughs> these living figures who were there, but yeah. among the, the dead, uh, you could argue Newman is the most influential. And I think the idea of development of doctrine, as he very carefully articulates it, 
is at play at, at Vatican II. And then in terms of, of substance as well, uh, of ecclesiology and the role of the laity and all that, uh, the prominence of priest, prophet, king as a category, that's coming right out of Yeah. Oh, Newman. that's huge in Lumen Gentium. Yeah. Yeah. And what I find intriguing there is Newman would have gotten that from the Calvinist tradition when he was a young kid. So Aquinas will mention priest, prophet, king, but it's not a dominant category at all. It is indeed in Calvin. And I think Calvin. from Calvin to the young uh, Newman, and then Newman, who brings it in his theology, then it comes through Bouillet and de Lubac and his disciples at Vatican II. So uh, Newman, in a lot of ways, is is key. But I think there, sure, development of doctrine. And, you know, like, like development can be very subtle. Development can be uh, rather dramatic. It can look like a real rupture with the past. And Newman's, you know, maybe hackneyed example, but the butterfly and the grub, right? I mean, that looks like yeah, a yeah. pretty <laughs> severe rupture, but yeah. in fact, it's development. But then, like you said, the um, uh, the development from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire on the surface looked pretty much the same. All the different offices were there, and you know, but in fact, it was a major um, rupture. So it, it's not always clear, you know. Oh, that's just a, a, a development. Oh, that's a rupture. It's not always clear. You know, sometimes things do look kind of dramatic, but they are in fact in continuity. Um, I think okay. in the ecclesiology, that's a, a point of real development. Um, the, the role of the laity, uh, the people of God theology, I mean, all of that, I think certainly the universal call to holiness. Uh, I, I've referenced her already, but uh, your hero, Dorothy Day, um, and, and the councils versus the commandment spirituality, I think she won the day. At Vatican II, uh, Vatican II would have affirmed that way of looking at it. Yeah. So I mean, I think in all those ways, you do you have real developments. Uh, I would say too, you know, not to bring up too controversial matter, but Lumen Gentium sixteen, which you know I've I preached that following Baltazar, we may hope that all people be saved. Certainly, Lumen Gentium sixteen gives us grounds for that, and that's a real development from Augustine, Aquinas, and many other figures in the patristic period. It's a, and this is Newman-esque, it's a recovery of certain antecedents in the tradition. Now look at Maximus and at Origen and many others, right? So Newman will say sometimes it's a anticipation of its future is a sign of a development. You know, so I, I would read Lumen Gentium 16 that way, that it's a, it's a real development and it's pretty dramatic. Um, but I, I would say it's not a rupture, it's a development. So th those are some some examples. A lot religious of religious liberty, obviously. Is I, I was going to say, bring up the religious freedom thing. That was a big thing for for Archbishop Lefebvre. You know, it, yeah. it's it's hard to read statements from like Pope Gregory in the 19th century. That, you know, calling the the very notion of religious freedom. I think he called it erroneous and absurd. Uh, mm. Obviously, reacting in many ways to the post French Revolution yeah. sort of atmosphere right. in in Europe. The the laicite. Of, yeah. of, of France and so on. So, it, you know, it's, it's contextualized. And, and yet you, you do see this amongst many, both on the liberal and the, and the sort of traditionalist wing of the church today. They do this thing where they'll, they'll, they'll quote something from the Council of Constance or yeah. like Sergei Domine of Pope Leo, and then line it up with some statement now from Vatican II. And look, look at how radically different this is. There's obviously here a rupture. And, and both the sort of, Silly progressives and and the you know staunch uh, traditionalists in, engage yeah. in the, in that kind of cherry picking of magisterial documents to make this point, right? And and in one move you got to be you got to be fair about it and to uh, to pit a conciliar statement against a non conciliar statement is, is a problem. You can't point to some lower level teaching from the tradition and say, oh, that it you know challenges right, a conciliar right. statement. You know, something like religious liberty, <clears throat> one of the keys to me is in when Courtney Murray, who is certainly one of the major contributors to that uh, Dignitatis Humanae, will say, true, error has no rights, which is the, the classic position. True, error has no yeah. rights. But erroneous people have rights. And I think that's the hinge upon which it turned. So he would say, no, I'm in continuity with the great tradition that said error has no rights. We're, we're not here to propagate error. But erroneous people have rights, and this belongs, now John Paul II put it this way, to the very deepest and most sacred part of my, my interiority and my conscience is my religious yeah, affiliation. Yeah. And so, of course, that has to be protected. And, you know, John Paul II represents, I think, a very interesting development. When he talks about human rights, which he did a lot, 
but he didn't yes. do it in a Lockean Hobbesian way or even Jeffersonian way. He used the language of modernity, but he gave it a biblical substance. Very interesting to me, the the, the nuance there. To my mind, that's a, a bit what Dignitatis Humanae is, is about. It's a, um, you might say an appropriation of modern sounding language, but I think it's coming up out of the out of the depths of our own tradition that would say, oh, it is. sure, error has no rights, but erroneous people have rights. And, it, uh, and, a, and a deeper reflection upon the, the, the inherently non-coercive nature of faith, that a, that a right. coerced faith is no faith. Right. Ratzinger right. makes this point when he says the advancement at Dignitatis Humanae in dignity is predicated on the on the realization that yes truth has an orientation to freedom otherwise it really isn't truth unless it has been freely uh, you know freely understood and and freedom obviously has an orientation to truth in, in reverse and that mutual orientation of truth to freedom freedom is is the basis of the whole thing and um, right. and my friend my friend uh, Nick Healy at the JP2 Institute in Washington yeah. and then the late great David L Schindler uh, they came out with this huge book on dignitatis humanae yeah. a couple of years ago uh, that goes through all of the schemata, all, all the various versions of it until you get to the final one. What they show quite clearly is the importance of the contribution of the French bishops in its construction and of, uh, of this obscure Polish bishop in particular named Karol Wojtyła, yeah. uh, that Who, they, wa right. they wanted it predicated on the concept of human dignity. And the most fundamental of human rights is the right to religious freedom, Wojtyla says, as John Paul II. But right, it goes back to Thomas Aquinas, who would certainly argue you, faith cannot be coerced. So yeah. that's why I'm saying it draws upon very ancient sources within the tradition. And it can sound like, oh, they're adopting modernity. But no, no, it's a, it's a ressourcement, I would say, of these great uh, ancient sources um, in, in very creative dialogue with the modern world. So that's how I would understand dignitatis humanae. Yeah, and I, as as do I, uh, and 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 I think that's the proper. I think you're exactly right. To turn to Newman in all of this, and and, and yeah. I I didn't mean to imply earlier when I was quoting Ratzinger and talking about hermeneutic of reform that Ratzinger was saying there are all these discontinuities littered everywhere. I was thinking more in terms of. Uh, you know, the sort of butterfly and the grub sort of yeah. effect here. You know, you've got you've got to take into account that there that, that, that development can look rather radical at times. Right. And, and change right. Things. Uh, but anyway, uh, I want to move on from that. We have uh, maybe about I, I don't want to take too, too much of your time. I know you have to go in about uh, 15 minutes or so. What, uh, let's talk a little bit about liturgy. Let's let's get ourselves into real trouble here now. OK, let's, let's get in. I want to talk a little bit about liturgy and because it yeah. does pertain to the council. Uh, I mean, full disclosure, I attend, even though I'm a cradle Catholic, I shouldn't admit this publicly, but I already have numerous times. I attend an Anglican ordinary at parish uh, here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, simply because I think the liturgy is beautiful. In fact, I think the liturgy is closer to what the council fathers had in mind than what the mass of Paul VI is. Now, I don't mean to put you on the spot once again, but what what are your thoughts on say, the Novus Ordo, as so-called, the, the old Latin mass, the Anglican ordinary liturgy? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's part of me that that feels, you know, fine. If, if these things are approved by the church and people find them um, uplifting and helpful to their spirituality, great, you know? Uh, I, I'm against those who say the Novus Ordo is fatally flawed. Right. The Me Novus too. Ordo, you know, comes up out of a council and with the approbation of the of the Pope of Rome, it was the mass that John Paul II and Mother Teresa of Calcutta benefited from. You know, so I I don't think that's the case. You and I both lived through the silliest season, arguably in the history of the Catholic liturgy. You know, so I mean, I saw with my own little beady eyes. <laughs> the abuses of of the Novus Ordo, the I mean, motorcycle so, story, right? Right. I mean, I, I right, right. Uh, the priest coming up the aisle on a motorcycle. Uh, so I'm I'm not blind by any means to those realities. Now I'm a diocesan bishop, and I I'm presiding over the liturgical life of this diocese. So, yeah, I hate all that. I hate the way the Novus Ordo was abused. Right. Now, in the course of my time as a priest, a lot of that has dramatically improved. And so, what I don't like is Rad Traz today who will just, you know, 
keep referencing the clown masses as though clown masses are going on all over the place. I, right. I've been a priest and a bishop now in, in three different dioceses and including LA and people tell me, Oh gosh, LA, there'll be, you know, the clowns running around. And I found the liturgy was, was very well done and stayed oh, yeah. according to the Roman rite, And, you know, so no, I, I think that's an exaggeration, but you know, if you, the Anglican ordinarian, if people like a Novus Ordo mass, that's, that's very, reverent that that participates in in some of the qualities of the traditional mass great yeah. um you know so uh what did sacrosanctum concilium want you know when you read those texts now they can seem pretty conservative to us they seem pretty staid like gregorian chant and you know the altar may be detached from the wall etc yeah et cetera. yeah but you know, again, to be fair, there's there's call it pastoral development that came out of those great texts, and and if it's under the aegis of the church and with the approval of then of it's the fine. Pope, I, yeah, I, yeah, I and fine. you certainly don't want to weaponize the the, the liturgy in these in, right. in, in, in in this way. Uh, to, to, but two things to, to to sort of support your your point there. First off, when I was at the University of Nebraska uh, as a freshman in 1977. Um, I attended the Newman Center there, at the, a very active Newman Center, turning out tons of vocations for the Diocese of Lincoln. And, yeah. and, and it was a Novus Ordo liturgy, and it was the day and age of the St. Louis Jesuits and the monks of yeah. Western Priory and tambourines oh, yeah. and guitars. And oh, yeah. every mass was a folk mass and so on. And yet it, it, it remains to this day the greatest faith community of Catholics I have ever, ever belonged to. And the yeah. e Eucharistic devotion in that Newman Center was second to none. It was absolutely stunning, the depth yeah. of the Eucharistic devotion. And yet here it was a guitar mass, a folk yeah. mass. A, and, and so my point is, is that the, the, the liturgy can sustain the faith of, of saints, you know, as long as all the, all the rudiments are there. The second yeah, thing I'd like you, to put. Right. You ahead. found the Roman right. And it might not be yeah. to my taste. Look, I play the guitar right. and the harmonica. I'm a big Bob Dylan guy. But yeah, I, don't I know think you that are. should be the appropriate mass or the music at mass. Okay. But can that kind of music be president mass? Yeah, sure. Sure. It was done, you know, tastefully and reverently, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's a matter of prudence. A lot of this, it's the prudence on the part of the Bishop who should be presiding over the diocese, the prudence on the part of the, of the presider. Uh, even the, I say the prudence of the community. You know, community should be able to police itself in a way and say, no, wait a minute, yeah, that, yeah. that's overboard. Um, and yeah, I really agree with you about the weaponizing. That goes on like crazy. All my yeah. life, we weaponized the liturgy. Oh, we have. I, I've been, yeah, these liturgy wars have been going on for far too long. And I would say this too, that, uh, like I said, I, I love the beauty of the ordinary at liturgy and so on. Uh, but my main problem with the Novus Ardo masses that I attended in local parishes around me wasn't that there were all these liturgical abuses going on or that there's some deep flaw in the Novus Ordo. It says that there was a banality and a lack yeah. of yeah. a lack of care for the aesthetics of the, of the liturgy yeah. in so many ways. But then the, I would point this out. If the traditional Latin mass were to ever come back as the ordinary form of the liturgy again, and it won't, it won't. If it were ever to come back, then I guarantee you, if you look back at the uh, the the example of the 40s and 50s, the vast vast majority of parishes that are that would be doing the old mass would be just as banal, just yes. as aesthetically unpleasing, yes. just as slipshod, maybe even more slipshod. Yes, and and let me give you some evidence for that. I'm I'm too young to remember all that, but I had a very good friend, Monsignor Bill Quinn, when I was a young priest, and Bill would have been ordained in 1940, and he was actually at Vatican II. It's a long story but a great Chicago priest, totally formed preconciliar church, ordained in 1940. So he's got 25 years before, you know, all that. And Bill made exactly that point. And Bill, by the way, loved the intellectual tradition, loved the church fathers, Aquinas, Chartres Cathedral. He loved Mozart. He loved the, the whole bit, loved all the aesthetic. But he would say just that, that in most Chicago parishes, the mass was done horribly uh, from an aesthetic standpoint. And I, I think it's funny that I was given a wonderful gift recently and actually from a, a Latin mass society. And it's a photograph of one of my heroes, Thomas Merton at his first mass. And it's Merton and he's elevating the host, you know, in that wonderful dramatic way. And he's surrounded by the ministers and he's at Gethsemane Abbey. It's a great picture. I love it. You know? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. That's a beautiful aesthetic, spiritually uplifting display. But Bill Quinn's point, the one you're just making was, 
let's face it, uh, most masses, they weren't like that. They, they were not very uplifting. They were kind of slipshod, a bad choir. Uh, you know, the other ministers didn't show up and the priest is mumbling away. And, you know, so, right, there's a kind of romanticism about the, the pre-council period that should be avoided. Yeah, my, but your other ahead. point about the banality of the Novus Ordo, yeah, I mean, heck, I, not just the the weird um, abuses of it, but sure, a lot of banal masses I've I've sat through certainly. Yeah, absolutely. And the other, to, not to put too fine a point on my father, who is now eighty nine, almost ninety, grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and went to a, a Polish parish, and uh, he he recounts the fact that. Almost every Sunday liturgy that they went to it was a large parish was no longer than 30 minutes long. Yeah, right. Uh, that was quite frequently not even a homily. And if there was a homily, it'd be like a minute long. Right. And there was very little music and the priest raced through the Latin and everybody was out in half an hour. And the whole liturgical movement was against all of that. So everyone yeah. we just mentioned, the Guardini and DeLubach and, and Reynold Hillenbrand in our country and Virgil Michael and D Godfrey Diekman, all those people, that's what they were against. There, there was no conscious active participation. The laity were just a, the spectators, the whole bit. That's where that movement came from. And that gave rise to Sacrosanctum Concilium. And I would say, too, that the critics of the Novus Ordo, who often point to all of the abuses and then turn back on the Novus Ordo and say, that's because the rubrics are too loosey-goosey. The rubrics allow for too many options and, and the priest's personality. Two things. Number one, that's not true. And number two, there. If there is a little more leeway in the rubrics than the old mass, I say that that's a good thing. One of the beauties of the Novus Ordo is is precisely that it's a little bit more. It has a little bit more plasticity to it Yeah. to tailor it to, to, to sort of different situations. Yeah. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was coming, <laughs> sign of the cross and then the, the greeting and then usually followed by a solid minute of sort of mindless banter on the part of the priest, because we were kind of encouraged, you know, well, get the people involved and be friendly and reach out to them. But what that did was it interrupted the ritual quality of the mass. So I'm no longer at a ritual. I've just suspended that. And now yeah. we're in a chit chat, you know, little moment and Hey, the weather's good. And Hey, the kids are here. Good to see you all. That was a problem. That that's like too much plasticity. You know, but yeah, yeah. But, uh, is there room at that moment in in the rubrics for the priest? Yes, to talk about the theme of the mass, about the the particular feast we're celebrating, or yeah, sure, sure there is. And that's not predetermined. It's got to be said in a certain way. You do have a certain flexibility. I do it at practically every mass. I say it's a confirmation or it's a baccalaureate mass I have tomorrow. Of course, I'll welcome the the kids who were there and maybe say something about Catholic education or, you know, fine, fine. But it's again, that prudential judgment of what's legitimate plasticity and what's an interruption of, of a ritual consciousness. I agree. And, uh, and I think this is a very, it's, this is not a tangential conversation because for many people, their, their most direct experience of the forms of the council are, are the liturgical reforms. And I, yeah. and I think that it's important that we defend to a certain extent, the reforms that that did happen from excessive criticism. Hey, look, we're almost out of time, but I want I want to yeah. uh, one last thing, if you don't mind, if you can stick no, around please. for five more minutes in your interview with uh, Brandon Vaught on Vatican II. Yeah. One of the things that really leaped out to me, because it's something I've thought about endlessly and, and, it, and it's really important to me, is this notion that the reception of Vatican II cannot involve the endless suspended yeah. animation of the church yeah. the church cannot be endlessly suspended in debate yes. as as a and the pretext for that is well we're listening to the holy spirit and that's why we're all these questions are constantly open-ended so i was wondering if you yes. could either repeat what you said in brandon's interview or maybe elaborate on it no I, i'd be happy to because that's coming out of our friends ratzinger baltzar and delubak so it was the beginning yeah. of the communio when they're you know, they're part of the victorious liberal party, but then the liberals split after the council into like liberal liberals and more conservative liberals, if you want to put it yeah. that way. Yeah. So you got the Kungs and Skilebexes and Ronners and and uh, company on, on the extreme left. And then you have these fellas that we just mentioned who are saying yes to the council, but no to these weird, you know, uh, applications of it. Well, they gave these reasons for the formation of, of Comunio. One was they didn't like the theologians uh, as a separate magisterium. So that was emerging at the time. You got oh, yeah. Roman magisterium with the bishops and the pope. Then there's this other 
it's like the University of Paris in the Middle Ages, like that now the new magisterium of the theologians. They didn't like that. Um, but the, the, the main reason is they didn't want a perpetuation of the spirit of the council, which was a stated goal of the concilium board, that the council was great, so we want the spirit of the council perpetuated. Now, these were all council men, right? Delu or, uh, Balsar wasn't there, but he was certainly in it inspired the council in many ways. They loved the council. But they said, no, you never want the spirit of any council to be perpetuated because a council is a necessary evil in a way. It's a dangerous moment in life of the church when the church has to suspend its work of praising God, serving the poor, and evangelizing. And it puts itself in suspense and says, okay, we got to resolve some things. So we'll go back to Nicaea, Chalcedon, and, you know, who is God? Who's Jesus? How do you define him? And then Council of Trent, you know, how do we deal with the Reformation? So the church puts itself in suspense. Right. And it it's a necessary moment. And it works through it, and it takes the vote, and it says the Holy Spirit gave us new direction. Now, this is Delubach, Ratzinger, and Balthazar. Now, get back to work. Now, get back to the real life of the church, which is praising God, serving the poor, and evangelizing. The problem is you say, no, I want a perpetual council. God help us. Now, now we're just wringing our hands perpetually, wondering who we are and who is Jesus and what's the nature of the church. Well, that's going to kill us. And, and see, they were dead right about that, it seems to me. Voitiwa yeah, would have agreed yeah. with that. They were dead right about that. Now read someone like Voitiwa, once he's John Paul II, it's like, let's go. Let's evangelize. There's the new evangelization. Launch into the deep waters. Yeah, and go right back to Baltazar. Schleifung der Bastionen. Okay, let's get going with it. So John Paul goes out to the ends of the world to proclaim the gospel. What he didn't want was, now what do we think about human sexuality? Right. And what do we think about birth control? And what do we is, think about yeah, the nature of the priesthood? That's right. What do we think about the church? No, 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 no. We did that, and it was very important that we did it, but we can't do it all the time. You know, so that's yeah, you the, the shadow side. I will use Jung's language, the shadow side of a perpetual synodality, I would say. Synod's good. I was part of a synod four years ago, the youth synod. And that's you know, Paul VI's inspiration that we should have these regular synods to look at issues. Great, great. You're like, How do we deal with young people? How do we, we best evangelize them? Terrific. That's a good thing for the church to do. What it shouldn't do, though, is who are we? What are we about? Who is Jesus? Or what? what? Yeah. That's going to undermine the project. Yeah, and it places way too much emphasis on the juridical and doctrinal aspects yeah. of the church, as opposed to her, its inner Marian subjectivity and Marian core of holiness, which is precisely why I started a Catholic worker farm and, and write so yeah. much endlessly about the universal call to holiness uh, and, the, and the need to, in a sense, overcome the, what, as you call them, the professionalization of holiness and the, and the spiritual athletes, you know, uh, of, of the monks and the nuns and so forth. Yeah. I think now the task of implementing the council is simply now let's we need a lay of Dorothy Day said a lay revolution of the heart where we now pursue the Sermon on the Mount, pursue holiness, pursue sanctity to me, which is well, the great one of the great legacies of the council. This would get me in trouble, but we're in trouble already, I guess, all these things. But uh, I'll say this <laughs> in my lifetime. Uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of rhetoric about the rights and the prerogatives of the laity. Good. Good. And getting lay people involved in the government of the church, great. I mean, my chance for your office is overwhelmingly lay people. Most parish staffs, overwhelmingly lay people. So great, all in favor of it. But that wasn't what Vatican II was interested in. You know, it wanted the laity to sanctify the world. Having been yes. fed yes. by the Eucharist and instructed by the church's doctrine, now go out and be great Catholic lawyers and politicians and writers and business leaders and parents and teachers and Go, go. Well, may I just say something? And this is a prophetic challenge to the laity. 75% of you stay away from mass. Uh, numbers of baptisms, plummeting. Numbers of marriages, plummeting. Um, uh, look at polls. The Catholic laity track right with the general national consensus on issue after issue. Whether it's gay marriage, it's birth control, it's divorce, it's... it's uh, uh, gender affirming care, yeah, all this yeah. business. The Catholic lady tracks right with the general population. Absolutely. That's a problem. And that's not what Vatican II wanted. It wanted the lady not just to have rights and prerogatives, 
but to have duties and obligations to go out and Christify the world. And so, you know, the era of the laity, great, but honestly, it's not going very well. <laughs> we want to be no, honest. It's not. This. Now, look, I we clergy, you know, guilty as charged. I mean, a lot of abuse on the part of the clergy. God knows. And I'm not denying that for one second. But the laity, to be honest, aren't aren't doing a great job. If the job is Christify the world, uh, you're staying uh, away from that. I mean, yeah, this is Dorothy Day's point as well. When she called yeah. the revolution of the heart of lay people, what she was looking out, and she saw what she called the, the bourgeoisification of the laity, yeah. the yeah. sort of what Berdayev called the cult of, well, of material well-being. Del Noche and others make this point. Uh, the laity have become utterly soft and bourgeois. In, 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 and their approach to Catholicism simply simply mirrors the culture. So there has to be this sort of top-down, bottom-up conversion of the entire church uh, to this fundamental you know, vision of, of the no, Second and, Vatican And, and Dorothy Day and, and Peter Morin, they're key players there in that they saw all this long ago, way before the council. They saw all this, and we're trying to, to make it happen. But I think that is one of the dropped uh, footballs of the council. I think we handed the ball. Come on, yeah. and off you go. And, and yeah, football yeah. I mean, uh, but I take your point, and it's very well taken about the laity have dropped the ball just as much, if not more, than the clergy. I mean, I was at uh, a mass not too long ago uh, in, in which there were probably about 20 people at mass. This wasn't near me here. About 20 people at mass, and there were five Eucharistic ministers. Now, this, this was not a Sunday liturgy. It was a daily right. liturgy. But as <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, is that what Vatican II really wanted? No. No. And it's not, it's, again, I'm not against it, but it wanted those five people out in the world, Christifying it, you know, yeah. in, in this yeah. radical way. And how about like not electing all these bozos who are supporting abortion on demand and, and mutilating our children and all that? You know, when people yeah. come to the bishop and say, hey, you know, what are you doing about that? I, I, my inner Cardinal George comes out and says, you elected these people. I don't mean the people talking to me, but I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, the laity, yeah, yeah. you elected these people. So th there's the task of the laity in the world is uh, you pick up the ball and, and you, you get going. Why don't we make that the last word, <laughs> okay. if you will? All right. Laity, you pick up the ball and you get going. And that's get a challenge directed from Bishop Barron. <laughs> do you have any last, well, not necessarily make that the last word. Do you have any last words you want to leave the audience? I know you got to go. Yeah, no, I do have the diocese to, to run today. But uh, no, I think what we talked about is, is important because it's the interpretation of the council, which is the most important event in the 20th century church. And we're still, I think, we still have a largely unimplemented Vatican II. That's my honest opinion. I and do too. That we've got caught up in certain wars and that I would dare say that, that we represent this kind of race horse and mall, the John Paul II reading of the council is what the church should be embracing. And the Catholic progressives and the rad trads, that, that, that's, not, we're, that's not the path forward. And the endless war between those two sides is not helping us. It's a re-embrace of the great teaching of the council and the interpretation given by John Paul. And I would say all the way through Benedict and Francis too. It's yeah. called the new evangelization. Now get up, go, do it. I agree. That's why I started my blog, Got Him at Spez, <clears throat> 22, yeah. because yeah. I, I it sometimes takes a, a full, people forget that it took Trent a long time to be implemented. Yeah. J just ask Athanasius what he thought of the implementation right. of Nicaea, okay, uh, right. or Maximus the Confessor later on, people like that. Yeah, the council Everybody is cut still- his hands and tongue off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, I started Got Him at Spez, 22, to promote and defend, not the council as such, but in a sense, the communal racialismant theology. Yeah. That, that, that it represents. And, right. and I think it is an ongoing and, and very much needed project. Uh, and as I tell people that uh, who are critics of me from the right and the left, look, people, this is the only game in town. There is no other alternative yeah. because essentially the council is a Christocentric reordering. OK, it, it promotes a right. theological anthropology right. that, you know, think de Lubach, drama of atheist humanism. It's a, it's a theological anthropology rooted in a Christocentric reordering of, of everything. That is the only path forward. It can own that can be the only path forward uh, yeah. and everything else is a dead end, which is why I remain passionate about it, even in my dotage. Uh, <laughs> and and God bless you, uh, Bishop Barron. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Larry. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot. Keep going. Word on fire. Uh, right. I just got the latest Bible. That's great. And uh, that's wonderful. Yeah. 
Oh, it's fantastic. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Barron, for being on the show today. God bless you. Goodbye.